Hey there, it's Steve from Serious Keto, and this is the Not So Serious Keto video podcast. Now, I have mentioned in a number of previous podcasts that typically I wind up recording anywhere between about 40 minutes to an hour worth of material, and then I whittle it down to 20 minutes, give or take. The stuff that gets cut out can be either just flubs, you know, I'd mispronounce something, which actually some of those still make it in, or it could be I just phrased something that just didn't come out right, or it could be an entire topic. And when that entire topic is removed, it could be just for time reasons, it was just a large, long topic, and I felt like that was the easiest thing to remove, or it could be that I just felt I didn't articulate that topic very well. Maybe I kind of came off as a complainer or just something. I, just, I didn't like the way that I felt that I came off. And one such topic that I've recorded now four times, this is the fifth right here, is on the subject of ingredient police. And the reason that has been deleted from multiple podcasts is both time, I find I take way too long sort of explaining it, and I probably will today as well, but also I just wasn't coming off the way that I wanted to come off. But over the last couple of weeks, as I've sort of reflected on this topic, I realized that it's not specific to food and ingredients, that there are just certain behaviors out on the internet that can either be helpful or not helpful. And you can see this behavior in comments on YouTube, you can see it in various internet forums, you can see it out on Reddit, where there are people out that wanna be helpful and help other people learn or help other people avoid mistakes. And there are people out there that are just sort of jerks. They're trolls, they're know-it-alls, they are self-appointed subject matter experts, they are crusaders, they are people with an ax to grind. I've seen this in videos on auto detailing. I have seen this in videos on guitar playing, on gardening. I'm sure it's everywhere, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen the exact same thing. Now, I think it gets a little bit more intensified when you start getting into food channels, and probably even more so when you get into specialized ways of eating, like keto. So, I mentioned crusaders. There are people out there in the keto world that are just dogmatic. They're militant, and they want to tell everybody, here's the right way to do things, and here's the wrong way to do things, and try and shame people when they're not living up to their particular standard of what keto is or should be. You also get the people that come in that maybe are vegan. And not, I'm not saying like all vegans are bad. I'm not saying that at all. So if you're vegan, peace, we're cool. But some of them are very much anti-keto. There are also people that are advocates of the standard American diet and are thus very anti-keto. And they think that, you know, we're going to kill each other and this ingredient is bad and that ingredient is bad. Basically, when it comes to the unhelpful people, like I said, the trolls, the crusaders, the people with an ax to grind, I can do without them. In fact, I ignore them in real life, so I ignore them here in the forums. So we're not even going to talk about them anymore. And then you have the helpful people, or the people who want to be helpful. And I'm reluctant to call them the ingredient police, because I don't think they're trying to act like police officers so much as advisors or just helpful people. And I really see their comments as falling into one of three buckets. The first of which is helpful and informed. So these are people that are able to cite studies that say this is why this ingredient is bad or inflammatory or harms your gut biome or whatever. I love those comments. I think they are helpful. They're helpful to me. They're helpful to your fellow viewers and commenters. It's, it's helped me steer away from a few ingredients that I've discovered are inflammatory to me. And once I quit using them, I started feeling better. The next category are people that are being helpful or trying to be helpful from a personal experience standpoint. So they may talk about something, a given product. Maybe it's Chalk Zero. I hear this from time to time. People will say, Chalk Zero spikes your blood glucose. They're saying that just because it spikes their blood glucose. It seems that for some people, the soluble corn fiber that's in Chalk Zero products does cause a blood glucose bump or spike. It doesn't for me. It doesn't for a lot of people, but it does for some people. So if you're sharing personal experience or even personal taste when it comes to a, a product, I think it's important that you make sure that you're talking about yourself, not 
just because it happens to you, it happens to everybody. And I do see that happen from time to time in the comments. The final category of people that want to be helpful when it comes to ingredients are the unfortunately uninformed or misinformed people. And it's hard to fault these people because their heart is in the right place. They're trying to be helpful. But unfortunately, like I said, they've been misinformed. And so many of these sort of comments are so quickly and easily dispelled just by a Google search or getting out onto a site like Healthline. Just, you know, you can get out onto Google and say, Healthline, is soy bad for you, for example? And Healthline is a wonderful site. It really summarizes things well in layperson's terms. It links to any sort of studies. It's very, very well balanced, I think. One of the reasons that I bring this up is I do find myself spending an awful lot of time dealing with comments when it's people that are concerned about a given ingredient. When, like I said, it's pretty easy to just get out in Google and get some information. Also, I would encourage any of you, whenever you're looking at studies, to be a little bit skeptical. First off, a lot of them are done on mice. And at the risk of stating the obvious, mice are not humans. It's easy to experiment on mice. It's cheap to experiment on mice. You get very rapid feedback on what you do when you experiment on mice. And unlike experimenting on humans, you can avoid certain ethical dilemmas. It's also very important to look at the dosage in these studies and extrapolate what would be a human dose. For example, there was a study of the effects of sucralose on the gut biome of mice, and it damaged their gut biome. But I extrapolated how much sucralose that would be for an adult, you know, in the 160 to 170 pound range, which is sort of where I operate. And it would have been the equivalent amount of sucralose of eating 42 packets of Splenda per day. And I forget how long they did this to the mice, how long they fed these mice this much sucralose. Seems to me it was a six to eight week experiment. And I don't think most humans are gonna consume that quantity of sucralose. So pay attention to dosage. Just because a lot is bad doesn't mean a little is bad. For example, if I said that a given food contains cyanide, you would probably say, no, I can't eat that, that's deadly. But, Get out and Google foods that contain cyanide. You might be surprised how many there are. A couple of other behaviors that I think don't really help out an argument are hyperbole. So saying, soy, soy is the worst thing in the history of mankind. It's worse than cancer and nuclear war combined. At least for me, anyway, I find that hyperbole is a little bit of a turnoff. I think that hurts an argument rather than helps it. Another thing that I'll do sometimes when someone will state that an ingredient is horrible and awful and poisonous and no one should ever eat it, I'll ask them for the source. And the response that I get very often is, look it up. And my thought is, why should I do that person's homework for them? They're the one that started the argument. They're the one that decided they were going to plant a flag in the ground. They should be the ones doing their own homework. I'm not going to look it up for you. Don't give me homework. Ultimately, the reason that I decided to bring this topic up is because I believe that the vast, vast majority of you, especially those of you that view the podcast, are people that want to be helpful. You want to help out each other. You want to help improve the keto community. And I'm sure you don't want to share misinformation, and I'm sure you want to be able to share information in a way that is most helpful to other people, that is most persuasive. But even more than that, I spent an awful lot of my life being a know-it-all, thinking I was the smartest guy in the room, thinking I knew more than anybody else. And as time went on, I started realizing that a lot of things I thought I was right about, I wasn't right about. And it stings a little bit to find out you're wrong. More so when you're really, really vehement that you're correct. More so when you truly, truly believe that you're the smartest person in the room. And it's hard not to feel maybe even a tiny little bit of resentment when someone proves you wrong. And I don't want to be the person that argues against someone who's trying to be helpful and proves them wrong and perhaps has them feel a little bit resentful towards me. And that's just my opinion, my hopefully humble opinion on how people can be more helpful within the comments. And that sort of creates a segue to a situation where I'm going to be a little bit of the ingredient police or ingredient advisor here. 
there are not a lot of ingredients that I cut a really, really wide path around. There are a few that cause me issues, like xylitol. I just cannot eat anything with xylitol. Just, I know where xylitol is in my whole body, starting right about here until it leaves. And that doesn't take very long. Sorry, TMI alert. Another ingredient that I really try very hard to avoid, in fact, the only time I have it is when I'm reviewing a product, is soybean oil. This is just a garbage, garbage oil. It's so heavily processed, and I get terrible inflammation whenever I eat anything with soybean oil. Now, you also have the whole GMO argument, like 94% of soybeans are GMO. So there's that argument as well. But ultimately, for me, the big thing is the inflammatory aspect of it, because I can feel that. I can feel that almost instantly. So whenever I see a product that has soybean oil, I'm going to call it out. That's, that's my contribution to the Ingredient Advisor People Club. I've also talked periodically about hidden carbs, and I'm about to talk about sort of a hidden ingredient. I mean, it's not completely hidden, but it's something that you probably wouldn't expect. And this was brought to my attention by my mom, who's also one of my viewers. Hey, mom. And she takes CoQ10, the supplement. She buys the Kirkland brand from Costco, and she was looking at the back of the bottle, and she saw the number one ingredient, check it out, soybean oil. Now, I don't take CoQ10, but it got me thinking about some of these gel caps. And one of the gel caps that I take from Kirkland also is vitamin D3. And I don't believe it's listed anywhere on the bottle, but I went out to the Costco website, there were a couple of places I had to click view more so that I could eventually find it. And this is what I found right here. Number one ingredient in vitamin D3, soybean oil. So my quick little takeaway on this is never assume that what you're putting into your body, no matter how safe it seems, no matter how organically it's labeled, no matter how keto -ly it's labeled, no matter how zero sugar it's labeled, flip over the back of the bag, the box, the can, the jar, and look at the ingredients. Look at the nutritional label. Be a skeptic. And now, I imagine as many of you are thinking, okay, time to go take a look at some of my supplements. We'll take a quick ad break. Last week, I started Throwback Thursdays, a new video segment where I would introduce an older video that maybe a lot of you haven't seen because you're newer subscribers. And I mean by newer within the past year or so. And if the first one is any indication, it seems like this is going to be a fairly popular segment. The reason I like it is, well, there's a couple reasons why I like it. First off, not a whole lot of effort to create that video, and then it links right into the old video. So I kind of get two video views for the price of one. It also allows me to answer some frequently asked questions about that recipe. Substitutions is a big one, or different ways of cooking. It allows me to revisit the recipe and see if there's anything I've learned from making it repeatedly. Are there shortcuts? Are there better ways to do it? Are there better ingredients to use? It also forces me to go back out onto my website and tidy that up a little bit to make sure that the look and feel of the recipe is consistent with the ones that I've been doing lately. So on the whole, win-win, a lot of fun. I hope you continue to enjoy it, and I hope that I can continue to introduce you to some of my older recipes that have kind of become staples here in my house. One of my older videos, in fact, there's several of them, maybe not several, at least a few though, that I had done, and I thought it would be a series, but it just didn't really take off, was doing a monthly review of like food or wine, Food and Wine magazine, it's not Food or Wine, Food and Wine magazine or Milk Street magazine, and going through all of the recipes and discussing which ones were keto-friendly, which ones were easily keto-modifiable or keto -fiable, which ones were going to be a little bit more challenging to make keto, and which ones were not keto at all, and then giving the overall issue of that magazine a keto-friendliness score. I'm thinking instead what might be interesting is maybe once a month, I take a cookbook, a non-keto cookbook, something from my extensive cookbook collection, and do a review of that cookbook. What percentage are keto-ready or keto-modifiable? And give it an overall score. Is it a keto-friendly cookbook? And is it a cookbook that I'd recommend? Does it meet the criteria that I apply 
when I'm trying to judge a good cookbook. So lots of pictures, well-written, good recipe flow, ingredients listed in the order that they're used, things like that. So if you think it would be interesting for me to do cookbook reviews and talk about keto friendliness, probably once a month, and I could do it either as part of the podcast or as a standalone video, let me know down in the comments below. In terms of last week's Easter egg, everyone who guessed, guessed correctly. I had back there a big stuffed, sort of egg-shaped Grogu from Star Wars The Mandalorian. Unfortunately, we introduced my grandson Colton to Grogu back before we knew Grogu's name, so back in season one of The Mandalorian, so he's firmly set in calling it Baby Yoda. I don't know that we're going to be able to convert him. It's just, it's uh, too entrenched. But there's definitely a lot of Mandalorian fans out there as my viewers, and uh, you got it right. That was the Easter egg. And that allows me to segue into sort of the final topic of this podcast, which is revisiting Easter. I record the podcasts generally on Saturdays and then publish them on Mondays, which means if something eventful happens on Sunday, I miss out on that for the sake of the podcast. One example of this was back in the football season when the Packers lost the NFC Championship. I think I'd put some sort of a Packer Easter egg behind me, and then they lost. So, bummer, and uh, you wouldn't know that they lost based on Monday's podcast because I didn't know that they'd lost. So, because I recorded the podcast last week on Saturday, I couldn't really share any Easter information. And that's what I'm going to share right now. And there was some good and some bad and some good. So first off, the good. We had my in-laws over, father-in-law, mother-in-law, brother-in-law. First thing that happened, my father-in-law, mother-in-law got here first. My father-in-law shook my hand and said, Happy Easter. Colton, from the other side of the room, saw this. And I just love this age because children are just sponges. They, what they pick up. So Colton ran over then and shook my father-in-law's hand and said, Happy Easter. And then he shook my mother-in-law's hand and said, Happy Easter. Then he came and he shook my hand and said, Happy Easter. Then he went to Connor and shook Connor's hand and said, Happy Easter. Now, I don't think he was just mimicking because probably a half hour later, my brother-in-law showed up and Colton ran up to him, shook his hand and said, Happy Easter. Kind of cool. That was fun. The weather itself was just beautiful. It's one of those days where you could just sit out on the deck or the patio and just enjoy how good it feels to finally have spring in Wisconsin. In fact, I got right on the edge of sunburned. My, my arms got pretty red, got a little red through the nose, and, uh, and that was awesome. And I sat there and I just chatted it up with my father-in-law, who is uh, getting very close to 87. He's pretty old. He doesn't understand what I do at all. And I don't think I could probably explain it in a way that he understands it. But it was still enjoyable just sitting out there on the patio, getting some sun, making a little talk. And then after they left, I was in my garage. I was assembling this Mickey Mouse car for Colton that you can sit in and steer and drive and all that stuff. And I heard sirens. Now, as a kid, I used to love sirens. Growing up in South Dakota, we didn't hear sirens that often. So to see an actual ambulance or fire truck driving, that was a pretty neat thing. That was a special deal. And whenever we were kids and we would hear a siren, we'd hop on our bikes and try and you know follow it via echolocation or whatever and, and see what it was because it was, it was cool. Now, as an adult, hearing a siren, not so cool, especially when you hear it getting louder and louder, and louder, and closer, and closer, and closer. And with each passing second, as it gets louder and closer, the hairs on your arms start to stand up a little bit. And this fire truck, and paramedic, and ambulance, and then police cars showed up at my neighbor's house. Not my immediate neighbor, but one house down. And my neighbor, I'm going to call him Arnie, that's not his name, but it's close, I haven't seen Arnie since COVID started, so it's been over a year. But he's the sort of guy who is always smiling. I never heard him speak an ill word of anybody. I don't think I've ever heard him complain. He was the sort of person that you just felt good being around. And he had had some health issues. He was 65. He had already had, I think, two heart attacks. He had been in a car accident where he broke his neck 
and probably should have died. At the very least, probably should have been paralyzed. But somehow he just kept on going until the Sunday when he didn't. And I wasn't close enough to him to feel grief. I felt sadness, but I didn't feel grief. A number of my neighbors all went over to his house and I, I could see them all sort of gathered around looking very grief stricken. There was a lot of crying and hugging and, and things like that. And I couldn't bring myself to go over. First off, as an introvert and a highly, highly, highly empathetic person, that just, it would have wrecked me. I, I probably couldn't have handled it emotionally. I did go to the, the funeral and visitation and, and spoke with the Arnie's wife and son and daughter, but I, I couldn't on that day go over there. I don't know if that makes me a bad person or insensitive. I prefer to believe it's because I'm hypersensitive. I decided instead that I would rather hang out in my backyard and play around with my grandson and my son, that that would be a better way to live life well. And that to me, I think, is the lesson that we should take whenever someone passes. We should take it as a reminder that our card could get punched any day. And if that's the case, we should do our best to live life well every day to live a healthy life, to live a happy life, to live a life where we're enjoying the present rather than worrying about the past or the future, enjoying the company of our loved ones. And I look back on myself and how long it took me to sort of learn that and still not fully learn it. I need, I need events like this from time to time to kind of remind me. But I spent over 50 years of my life not really being present and not really caring about my own health. And I was very much on a path where I believe, and I don't think that this is exaggeration, that that siren would be for me, if not by now, soon. And I'm so very, very grateful that I took steps to change my health, to change my life. And I hope that you is you take these same steps. I mean, I don't think you would be here on Serious Keto if you weren't concerned about improving your own health, your own life. Just take a moment and give yourself a little bit of pat on the back. Have a little bit of pride for the fact that you are improving your life, not just for yourself, but for your loved ones. And I had hoped that I could come up with something really profound to say to end this podcast, but I can't beat what Master Ugwe said in Kung Fu Panda, which I'll need to read here. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. But today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. Thanks for watching or listening.